This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community, working in legislative, regulatory, and political arenas to promote the free enterprise system. Information at VAChamber.com. Virginia hospitals and health systems provide jobs. They support our economy and promote public health. Local hospitals are always open to help people with unexpected health needs. Having a stable health care network is vital. Virginia hospitals are our lifeline. It's amazing what my students with special needs can accomplish. Their pride is priceless. That's why I teach. Brought to you by the Virginia Education Association. Because a good education is good for everybody. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. and by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. This week in Richmond, and a very special welcome to Pete Geeson, who served in the House of Delegates, and Walter Stosh, who served in the House of Delegates and the Senate of Virginia. And some of the years that you were in the House, this fellow to your right was one of your colleagues in the House. And yeah, that. Wanted to really get the, the two of you here. I've had Senator Stosh on several times, but Pete wanted to get you on this show while we're still in the General Assembly building. Because soon we'll be out of this building and down the street in the Pocahontas building for, for the legislators' offices as well as for, for the studio. And appreciate your coming and talking about things past and things present as you would <laughs> want to. And, and Pete, since you served at an earlier time than Walter, we'll start with you. Now, I, I want to tell the viewers one thing about you that you are probably one of two <clears throat> legislators that I know of whose mother served in the House before them. The, Is there a the, second one? The, I thought, the other one darn, was, I thought The I other was one was really far one. before you was a woman from Buchanan County, one of the first women to serve, and she died after a term, and her daughter followed her the next, mm. the next oh, term. Oh, that's right. I do so so you, you were the second in following your mother who served. Yeah. I always so, tell people I followed my mother's footsteps rather than my father's. Ah, uh, yes. Who was a coach and who actually was asked to run for Congress in 1952, declined. So Dick Poff ran from the 6th District instead. My dad said, there's no way he can win. And then, of course, he rode Eisenhower's uh, coattails right. and won. And my dad didn't go to Congress. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Pete, why don't you start, and then we'll get Senator Stosh in the conversation, too, about some of your recollections about the people you served with, uh, oh recollections about uh, a bill of yours that was vetoed by a governor, and maybe one of the first ones to be overridden in modern history. Yeah, well, it was, because we didn't have the reconvened session early on when right. I first came to the General Assembly, which was... It, back in the dark ages, 19, my first term was 1964, but this was in about 1972. Um, no, it was a little later than that, 1992, I'm sorry. When you have 30 years of experience and five years of watching my mother before that and 20 years since then, it gets a little fuzzy blends sometimes. together. Blends <laughs> together. Anyway, <clears throat> Doug Wilder, we had a bill that uh, would allow retirees from the state that were under the... Um, Virginia retirement system to run for office, get elected, and then they had the option of not taking retirement and adding to the years of service or taking a retirement and then not contributing anymore to the retirement system or getting credit for their terms of office. Several legislators would be affected by it, but also there were several people out that had called me and said, We'd like to run for office, but we can't give our give up our uh, retirement system. 
funding and run for that office that doesn't pay, but I forgot it was at the time, but now it's uh, for the House. It's only $17,640. The Senate, of course, gets a little mm. bit more. Uh, Older, wiser, worth more. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I was in, actually in Maryland, I mean, in, not Maryland, in Pennsylvania at a business meeting. On the way back, and I had one of the few car telephones at the time, Al Dynastine and I, and uh, we, the phone rings, and my, it's my aide. And she says, I just got word from the governor's office that he vetoed your bill. And I said, he did? That's a good bill. She says, well, I'm sorry. I, I, you can do what you want, but he vetoed it, and he let, let us mm -hmm. know. So I picked up, hung up that one, and called Dickie Cranwell, who was at the time the majority floor leader on, at the, in the House. I said, Dickie, you, you remember that bill? And I blamed the bill and the number. And he said, well, yeah, that's a good bill. I said, well, your governor <laughs> just vetoed it. He says, he did. He says, I'll tell you what, Pete. He says, you call all the Republicans and I'll call all the Democrats and we'll override. And we got a good vote mm -hmm. to override it in the House. Went over to the Senate and um, Senator Miller was... Uh, carrying it from Harrisonburg, and he would be affected by it. But first vote was about two votes shy of override. The Senate has this rule of you, you then vote, you then move for reconsideration. And we went over, Dickie and I both went over and twisted a couple arms, including the one I really liked was uh, Delegate Steve Martin from Lynchburg, who had already had, or he hadn't, but a the Democrats had already had a former superintendent of schools who had just retired call me hmm. and say, is your bill going to pass? I said, well, I think so. That was several weeks before. And he said, well, I hope so, because if it does, I'm going to run for office against Steve Martin. I said, oh, against Steve Martin? I said, you shouldn't do that. He says, well, I'm, you know, I'm a good Democrat. I'm, I'm thinking about it. I said, well, it's still a good bill, and we'll try to pass it. And we, so I went to Steve Martin. He says, I, you know what's happening. He, he, you've talked to my possible opponent. You don't want me to vote for it. I said, well, yes, I need your vote, uh, Steve. We, we need two more votes to override. And they did. They overwrote wrote it with two votes. And so that was the first, as far as I know, that was the first override of a governor's bill in, the, in the, what the staff likes to call the reconvene session. Right. Most of us still call it the veto override session. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think you had one over uh, uh, that occasion where you got a bill of uh, veto overridden, didn't you? I did, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was, you know, Pete has always been one of my uh -oh, mentors and idols. We served in the House of Delegates together, and he was kind of the go-to guy in those days. <laughs> so I've enjoyed our relationship over all these years. I had one, too, back during the days when the car tax was being discussed. Uh, my friend William Wampler and I, who were in the Senate and on the Senate Finance Committee, were concerned about the commitment that was being made to the out years and the impact that would have on our children and families. And yet the governor at that time was insistent that we move that car tax forward to 100% relief. It's always good to reduce taxes and provide relief, but you have to have some fiscal responsibility in doing it. So Senator Wampler and I both voted no to advancing that, and the governor was not too happy with us, so he vetoed one each of our bills during that <laughs> session. Hmm. So the, fortunately, the members of both the House and the Senate decided that it's important to make the distinction between good good government and retaliation, so they joined together and we overrode those two vetoes. So that's my experience. Those are probably three of the f very few. I don't know, that, you know, we don't hear of vetoes being overridden under this governor, his predecessor, the one before him, it seems. You know, David, it shows one thing, and Walter's quite right, that uh, while Bill Wampler and he are both Republicans, and the governor was Republican. Didn't you have a Democrat majority in, in the Senate and House at that time? It could, you, could have been, yes. Yeah, I think it was, because mm -hmm. it certainly was when I worked on the bills that uh, Doug Wilder 
vetoed on this. But it shows a cooperation that isn't quite prevalent in this day and time in the legislature. Uh, and it's uh, that we used to have between members of the opposite parties, the two parties in, in the legislature. We had our political tufts uh, occasionally, turf, that we tried to protect, but generally we were all working to get good legislation passed. Is that accurate, uh, Mr. Uh, Garsh? Yes, sir. In your, your tenure? Yeah, okay. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, Walter, thinking about your years both in the House and the Senate, and, and just in a short time that you've been out, uh, some of the people that you served with or some memories of, of even of this building, because it was, interestingly mm -hmm. enough, during this session just ended, there was more nostalgia expressed by legislators, by their staffs, by lobbyists, by other people about leaving this General Assembly building. When people had been saying, we need to be out of here because right. of the asbestos or this or that or whatever, but uh, uh, some, some memory of back in the earlier years or your more recent years. Well, I actually have a history with this building that predates my activities uh -huh. in the General Assembly. When I was a student at the University of Richmond, fresh out of the military and <laughs> on the GI Bill, I nevertheless still had to work. So one of the part-time jobs I had was in or with the Life Insurance Company of Virginia uh -huh. in this whole building. So I actually started my, my work career after the military in this building. <laughs> now, we have seen uh, some real giants walk these halls. I mean, people who were obviously very committed to doing what's right, to do, try to make a difference in the lives of people, and I can uh, hesitate to mention right. any without right. the, but the risk of exclusion, but I think of people like Hunter Andrews in the Senate, mm. uh, John Chichester, who was my predecessor uh, as chairman of the Finance Committee, uh, more recently John Watkins, people like that who really gave a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of their lives and penalized their businesses, did all the other things that are not, not generally well known to serve in, in this august body. And at, at some point in time you reach that point where you say, I, I may be able to do a little something else, a little more, right. but it's time to kick back and enjoy the grandchildren or great-grandchildren <laughs> or so most of us who retire fortunately or do so when we want to when we choose to and uh, it, it is good to reflect upon some of those people who have been so instrumental in making Virginia probably the best state in the nation. You know David I might add to that that one of the things that uh, you remember is that when I first came here, of course, none of these buildings around Capitol Square belonged to the state. They were mostly all private. This, now, this was back in the Dark Ages, of course, 1964. But when John Warren Cook became our speaker, he uh, kindly put me on a few committees since I was, at the time, one of the more senior in service uh, legislators, and there were very few of us that were Republicans. So I was sort of part of the token Republican. But the head of our building committee, joint building committee, the Senate and the House, was Senator Ed Willey from Richmond. And he, he got us together the first time we met that I was on the committee. He says, now, I want you all to know that we've got to start buying the buildings around the Capitol Square because cap the government's going to grow. He says, so we know it is, and we've got to get prepared for it. So the reason we are here in this building, mm, mm -hmm. originally from Life Virginia, was because when it came on the market, it really would call us no matter what time of day or night and have us come down with the building uh, builder the, uh, division the agency and they would explain to us why they thought we ought to buy, buy the building, what they're going to do with it, what they're going to move in. And in practically every case, including the train station, including the um, old um, buildings on the other side, down where the where the Supreme Court is now, Federal Reserve Building. When we got down there, 
they always made a very convincing case, and we always put it in the next budget and bought, and bought them. I have a story of Senator Willie, too, that I can share. <laughs> and I think the first bill that I put in was at the request of the parents of a Little League association out in Enrico. They had been visited by the health department, and the health department decided that even though these parents could cook hot dogs and hamburgers in their backyard, <laughs> They could not cook them on the in this area because it had a little shack, and that shack did not have triple sinks and running water and all the <laughs> other things. So I put in a bill to exempt Little League concession stands from the health of the restaurant bill, restaurant law, thinking that as a young Republican minority, I could get it through the House, but what am I going to do when I go to the Senate? So, <laughs> so I went to the Senate committee. They happened to be on a Saturday. And there was sitting was Senator Parkinson, my, my senator, and Senator Willie was chairing the committee. It must have been the health committee. I it suppose. probably was. <laughs> so before I could even say anything, Senator Parkinson spoke up and said, now, ladies and gentlemen of the committee, this is Delegate Stosh. He's one of my delegates. You know, they had this parochialism. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. Yes. So then Senator Willie spoke up and said, well, I represent part of Enrico, too. He's one of my delegates. So I thought the courtesy thing to do was to try to explain the bill. And before I got two sentences in, Senator Willie spoke up and says, I know all about this bill. I moved the bill passed. Senator Parkinson said second and went through. <laughs> I found out later the health department had visited Senator Willie's drugstore and condemned his salad line. So he was kind of, he was kind of mad. <laughs> yeah. The timing was perfect. <laughs> the timing was right. That's what's known as practical politics. <laughs> yeah, right. that's, that's what you call dumb luck. Yeah, dumb luck. Right. But those are the experiences yeah. you reflect upon. Right. Yeah. Sure they are. It's... Um, you know, as you say, I, I had the the pleasure before I was elected of having been down here two for two sessions, watching my mother and learning a little bit about the process right. and so yes. forth. Now, one of the things when I came down here was that you learned only by talking to other members of your party or, or other legislators, except that I already had some of that experience mm. when I got down here. Um, and one of the things that she said that I later, when we started doing a little more formal presentation to the freshmen to try to get them oriented, was that listen to lobbyists. You'll learn soon which ones are the good ones. Mm -hmm. Now, we only had at the time four or five, didn't have very many. And they will teach you what's good or bad about a bill if they can teach you both sides then they're a good lobbyist, mm -hmm. and you listen to them. Mm -hmm. And the other one was, make friends with the media. <laughs> and my mother, having been mm -hmm. in, in the newspaper business at home in Radford, uh, that was a good, sound recommendation. And you find a lot of people that don't understand that they need to be sure that the media is on, get to give them fair press, not to, not to stress things or stretch things or to give false information, but the media can really help you as far as your political future is concerned. And I learned that even when I was just a member of the very, very minority. There were only 11 Republicans in the House when I was elected. 11 out of, out of 100, that the other 89 were all nice, most of them. They just didn't allow you to put in any bills that got passed. <laughs> that yeah, area. that was a favorite tactic in the old days. If you, if you had a good bill, someone who wanted to lay claim to that, could do so and reintroduce it. And I had that happen to me yes. several it, times. And, it, and I remember one time I put in a bill that I thought was really a great bill. And I happened to have been on the Senate Finance Committee as a, as a relatively new person in the Senate at that time. And the bill was assigned to the Finance Committee. So I realized I'd have an opportunity to explain that bill to my committee. So I went to the chairman, who was Hunter Andrews. I said, Senator Andrews, I have a bill in that would eliminate the bee pole tax. I said, as a, someone who's been a CPA for 40 years or whatever it was, I've always hated that bee pole tax. I always thought it was unfair. He said, yeah, I know you got the bill in. So I was expecting him to say something else. <laughs> I said, well, uh, what's its status? He said, well, I assigned that to the taxation subcommittee. 
I said, well, when do they meet? He said, well, them who knows know, them who don't know don't need to know. <laughs> <laughs> so when I became chairman of the Finance Committee, one of the first subcommittees I created was the Taxation Subcommittee. <laughs> I never did see that bill. You never, he's, oh, no, you it never got on the docket. <laughs> uh, a, a phantom subcommittee. <laughs> they, uh, never met. No, no. And there was always the occasion where a chairman, unlike him, I had a bill on roads, and I went to the roads in, in the house, chairman, and asked him about the bill. And he says, oh, I've got it. I've got it. I've got it right here. I said, oh, good. He says, what are you going to do with it? I'm keeping it in my pocket. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he did, mm -hmm. and it, it never saw the daylight. And as Walter has said, on numerous occasions, if you put in, in the early years, back in the 60s and 70s, if a Republican put a bill in, it was a pretty good bill, it might come to light, but it'd be with somebody else sponsoring it and gets passed. And Walter, I know, I remember him saying, says, oh, I've got a way over, over, over in the House. And I said, oh, you do? He says, yeah, we, the chairman of the Appropriations Committee is uh, from the, my, is, represents some of the same territory that I do. He says, I'll get a good bill and I'll go over and talk to him and say, you know, the people in our area really want this, this done. You reckon we can get it done? He said, oh, yeah, yeah, I think that's a good idea. I'll put the bill in. <laughs> and, and Walter said, that's a good idea. Why don't you do that? <laughs> Well, just, just to bring it up to date, I think in later years, I think we yeah. graduated from that. I know I had yeah. a policy in the oh, finance yeah. committee that every bill deserved a hearing. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we had no pocket vetoes or assignments to phantom committees mm -hmm. or anything. You vote them up or down and give the member a hearing on, the, on that bill. And, and uh, I think that works better than some of the shenanigans we used to have in the early days. All right, that, that would certainly fall in the category of an improvement in, in the process. <laughs> in our closing two or three minutes, if you, if you could wave some kind of a magic wand from JMU where you're teaching students and uh, from Henrico County where you're working to help kids get scholarships so they can go to college, if you could wave some magic wand to change yet something else down here at the General Assembly for the good of the whole process, good of the people, what might it be? And, and, if, the, and if the little uh, one with the magic wand said, now you only get one, but what, what, would, you, what would you think about that, that would be a good improvement to be made? I will uh, let the, Senate, you know, go, let the Senate goes first. Oh, well, I, the Senate I've, is the body, I have had, the other body. I have had uh, many opportunities to work on tax policy, education policy and a host of other things, but I think it kind of boils down to me that there's a continued need to try to help young people uh, access success as we've enjoyed it. And that generally means education. Right. And I, if I could change anything, I think I would make the pathway easier for young people to attend the community college as the first two years of a four-year pathway. I would drive down the cost it's undisputedly the, an equal quality education. And it's probably the only way many families can access an affordable level of a four-year degree. So that I, if I were here one more time, I would try right. to make that happen. Right. And, and we, we actually have started that. Uh, the, it's now if, if you go to a, a qualified community college and get two years, you can then get if you yeah, have I think, a C or I think the senator helped get that through. He did. He did. He, did. he got that, that the, through. Senate, uh, C or more. So now, so now, use the rest of your time. What, what you're going to wave your magic? Well, my, magic my, on? my, as my wife says, my um, devotion while I was in the house was mental health right. and strengthening right. the mental health system in the state. And we've come a long way, but we still got a long way to go. Uh, we, when, when I first came to the General Assembly in '64, we had. Massive uh, mental health hospitals with three or four thousand people in mm -hmm. some of them. Mm -hmm. We've got we trimmed trim them down. The problem was we went too f too fast. One, secondly, when we've built the new hospitals, we didn't leave enough beds. Now we've got the other problem, and I would still be here working on that if I was still in the, in the legislature. 
really thank you, Pete Geeson, for making the journey down from the Shenandoah Valley for the day. And Senator thank Kostosh, you. welcome you back as a, as a guest. And if we had another hour, we could we could fill up three programs talking. But thank thank you both for being on this thank week you. in Richmond. Thank you. I enjoyed it, Dave. This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community. For jobs, the economy, and public health, Virginia Hospitals, our lifeline. The Virginia Education Association, because a good education is good for everybody. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. And by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you.